I'm Tim Robson. I'm the interim university librarian. Uh, I'm based in the Calvin Smith Library. Uh, and I have to say, uh, this is a fantastic thing that this workshop that's going on today because uh, I go back here a long ways and we first started talking about doing electronic theses and dissertations over 10 years ago. And when we first started talking about it, no one could even conceive of that of that idea. So this is fantastic progress that that we have made. Um, I'm I just want to talk for a couple of minutes um, uh, to follow up primarily on some things that Brandon just said and also uh, some things that the faculty said this morning in their panel uh, relating to the work of your dissertation and how it relates to your um, academic legacy out in the out in the world and and as professor hall said this morning uh, the fact that these are now posted on the internet and as brandon said as soon as they're published they are out there for the world at large to see uh, there are some things that um, that that you should know about and i want to give you just a few statistics um, that uh, that will indicate uh, just how significant your research is to your career as well as to the university's reputation. Uh, we, uh, my colleague Tom Hayes here is, is uh, going to be talking about multimedia, but he's also our head of digital library programs. We, we run a service uh, at the library for the university called Digital Case, which is our uh, digital library where we have a, a, a set of curated collections that relate to the scholarship of the university as well as uh, collecting some digitized uh, library materials from our collection that we have made available. And one of the collections in Digital Case uh, is the Case Western Reserve University uh, Electronic Theses and Dissertations. Uh, what happens with this is that we uh, use OhioLINK's uh, ETD repository as our trusted source of these dissertations. So you're submitting it to OhioLINK, but then we go in uh, regularly and retrieve the metadata from OhioLINK and create our own collection of dissertations uh, for digital case. We're not actually uh, scooping up the documents themselves, we're just uh, taking the metadata and you're linked back to OhioLINK. Um, some of you may have been in libraries in the past or you may remember libraries where you could go to the stacks and see range after range of black bound volumes with often with gold lettering down the spine which were the dissertations from from the past well uh, it, having worked in libraries for a long time I know that those dissertations took up a lot of space in the library and almost never got used by anyone uh, <laughs> which would uh, sort of follow up on Professor Hall's uh, comment this morning about some student who said that they thought, oh, well, their dissertation will only be on microform somewhere and nobody would ever look at it. Well, that is, that is no longer the case because once they get to, uh, once they get to OhioLINK and especially once they get to digital case, the, the metadata, that, that metadata is indexed almost immediately by Google. We, we actually, guide Google to our ETD metadata and, and it's happening um, very rapidly. And I, I just want to, I, I went back after the panel this morning and ran some statistics uh, for uh, the last fiscal year, that is fiscal year nine, July 1 of 08 through June 30th of, of uh, 09. And of Case Western Reserve University dissertations, theses and dissertations, there were 188,484 views. And to compare that to those, those black volumes on the shelf, it, it is absolutely astonishing. Uh, now, we have no way of knowing what use uh, those, those dissertations were put to, you, uh, put to but um, I, I did also look at the top 10 for, last, uh, for uh, the last year, and the top, the top one was, um, the title of it was Photo Dissociation of Gas Phase Organic 
Vacations. I have no idea what that is. I, I, by back, I'm actually a musician by, by training. It was, a chemist, it was a chemistry dissertation from 1991, and it was viewed 459 times the last year. Uh, and it just if you're, th again, thinking of bound volumes, there would be no way physically possible for those dissertations to have circulated that, so that, uh, that much. Uh, so it, it gives you uh, an idea of the, the breadth of, uh, of the, the scope that your dissertation is going to have out in the, uh, out in the world. Uh, just, just for kicks, I looked up where we stand for, for this year, and there are already uh, almost 50,000 views of our Case Western Reserve dissertations for this current fiscal year, so since July 1 of, of last year. Uh, I, just a couple of other little things that you should know. Not only do your dissertations show up in the Ohio Link ETD Center and in Digital Case, but we also catalog the electronic files and they go into our online catalog. So that is yet another mechanism that people can get to your, to, uh, get to your research. Uh, and they can link directly from our online catalog to the, to the dissertation. Um, the, the last thing that I, uh, that I want to just follow up on what Professor Hall said this morning and what, what Brandon said, um, and that is if you, this is, this is particularly important for the sciences and engineering, and that is if you are dealing in any kind of proprietary data, um, patent, uh, patent things, things that you don't want to have people know for a certain time, you should talk to your friends in the School of Graduate Studies and, and ask to have an embargo. It doesn't cost anything. You can do it, I think, for up to two years. Is that, is that right? You have to talk to them. You have to negotiate that with the School of Graduate Studies. But um, once, as Brandon said, once it gets published, it can't be taken back. Uh, really the only, and, and sometimes I've been involved with these, people come to the library and, and say, oh, I, my IRB stuff wasn't right and I need to have it taken, taken down, or my faculty member advisor saw that I put some data in that shouldn't be there. Well, it's already gone, and as you know with Google, once, once they get it, there's not too much to be done about it. So really the only, the, the only way that someone, something would be taken out is if there was a matter of academic fraud or plagiarism or some other kind of copyright um, matter. Say you used a, uh, a figure or data from another scholar that you did not have permission for it and that scholar came forward and says, this is my work. Uh, so it's really a very, very small um, range of opportunity to, um, to remove your thesis once it has been submitted. But um, I, I just want to emphasize how important your theses are to the university and to uh, recruiting future students and recruiting future faculty to the university because it, it quite often we'll hear, I went to, I went to your um, dissertation website and I looked at the kinds of work that the students are doing and what, uh, what is going on at the university. So uh, you, you may think of yourselves just as graduate students or doctoral students, but you really have a very uh, significant um, role in the, in the reputation of the university. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, as, as Tim pointed out, I am the head of digital library programs, uh, but I also wear another hat, and that is as the managing librarian of the Friedman Center. Um, how many of you have been in the Friedman Center? Okay, it's got some work to do here. Um, <laughs> Um, the Friedman Center is a language learning, a multimedia uh, services center, and it's also um, an avenue to get content into digital case as well. Um, 
the Friedman Center's mission, and I'm not going to say it by rote, but one of the main important features of it is to encourage the use of multimedia in teaching and in learning and in the presentation of your, uh, your work and your materials. Um, and one of the reasons for that is um, oftentimes a model will serve uh, much better as a form or an avenue to understanding than any kind of uh, text uh, will do. So two pages of text will not be uh, possible, uh, it will not be possible to explain as well what a visual model or what a video perhaps or some kind of oral uh, statement um, or explanation will. Um, and we're very convinced of that, so one of the things that we try to do is to encourage uh, faculty and students to use multimedia in the work that they do. Um, one of the ways that we do this is a program called the Friedman Fellows Program. Uh, the Friedman Fellows Program is largely, uh, well, it's entirely directed toward faculty. Uh, and we give out $3,000 awards, uh, six of them annually, to encourage faculty to use multimedia in uh, their curriculum, uh, in their research, um, and things like that. Uh, one of the things that Kathy Wells, who's in the room here, is working on is such a program that's similar for graduate students. So we have identified a need that uh, extends beyond just faculty to include uh, you. Um, so we are thinking about that. Um, it's in its very infant stages, so if you have any thoughts on how something like that should work or what it should look like, uh, please let uh, Kathy know. Um, but uh, in, in terms of um, in terms of the use of multimedia, one of the things I kind of want to step back with a little bit is to say uh, more broadly something like digital tools, to think of digital tools as opposed to just multimedia. Um, digital tools can include things like um, text mining um, and uh, OCR, things that aren't necessarily visual or oral uh, but have a, uh, a purpose for creating new ways of visualizing information or data. Um, how many of you are planning on using, how many of you have thought about using multimedia in a dissertation? Okay. Okay. Um, anybody planning specifically on doing it? How many of you could care less about using <laughs> multimedia in, in a dissertation? Are you talking about the actual document or in the defense? Uh, well, actually that's a good question, uh, in both. Um, but in the dissertation, I'm speaking specifically about the dissertation, but Sure, in the defense as well. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by using multimedia in the dissertation? I mean, you can use PowerPoint to create a model or, or something like that, but I don't understand the extent that you're taking this. Yeah, I'll or show. I'm going to show some examples. I think well, hopefully we'll yeah, um, shine a better light on it. Um, okay, well, on that subject. Um, at the, the most recent Friedman Fellows um, program that we had, we had a speaker come in from the University of Maryland and um, she was actually at the time finishing her dissertation um, her name was Tanya Clement and she was interested in Gertrude Stein's novel uh, The Making of Americans and the novel itself um, is uh, very difficult to read and comprehend. It's uh, written in uh, almost stream of consciousness, but it also has very reflexive sentences that kind of wrap back on themselves repeatedly. And it makes understanding very difficult. And at the time that she wrote it, it was dismissed uh, largely by critical circles as being um, gibberish, uh, being useless. Uh, being not something that was fit to be considered literature. Um, and in many ways, it's not been something that has been looked at critically uh, ever since. Uh, well, what um, Tanya did was she got permission to digitize uh, the novel, and she uh, ran optical character recognition on it, OCR. So she turned it into a massive text document. And then with her work at the University of Maryland in a project called the, the Monk Project, um, they used tools to text mine and find patterns in the novel. And by doing this, she was not only able to find that the repetition of certain phrases was consistent 
throughout all the nine chapters of the book, but that there were areas in the book where that repetition stopped. And where the repetition stopped, there were episodes. And those episodes were stories. And those stories cast meaning, uh, a broader meaning, on what she was talking about with the breadth of the novel. And just to give you an idea of uh, how some of this, they include supplementary data here in this Oxford. Um, let's see. I don't know. Well, first of all, let me just show you kind of, this is just a PDF of what the interface of the text pattern um, software looked like. So she was able to um, enter a pattern, whether it was just, um, you could enter a, a set number of um, letters or characters, um, you could enter entire words, or you could enter phrases, and the phrases could be any length. And you can see the occurrences throughout the novel of these words. So this is the number of times that they occurred. She broke it down by chapter, so you can see here's the occurrence of phrases throughout this nine chapter book. And there's a legend down here which shows the occurrence of certain words in those chapters. So for instance, in chapter one, you see uh, the word living appears very frequently. Um, and in fact, through all the chapters it does. Um, children and so forth. So she was tracking how um, words and phrases were used by Gertrude Stein. Um, let's see. This shows um, how the episodes worked. So she would find in certain chapters phrases, and then, uh, as I mentioned, she found vacancies, so where the pattern stopped. And so she highlights this in the chapters, and then she points out to the different episodes that occur. But I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, but the, the point is, through using text tools and text analysis, um, one of the tools was called Hyperpo. Um, there's also, actually, if you read the article, you'll find out all the tools that she used to do this. Uh, but the main point is that a, a novel that was um, largely dismissed or hadn't really been critically evaluated um, was returned to with this. And by using text analysis tools, she was able to find patterns um, in the text that show that there was intent on there being put in in a certain way. The writing was done in a certain way. So accusations against Gertrude Stein that it was gibberish or that it made no sense, um, perhaps that might be so to some readers, uh, but it was certainly intentional on her part. There was intent there, um, and she was able to recognize these patterns by using uh, these tools. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, the journal called Vectors? All right. Um, there's a journal called Vectors from the University of Southern California. Um, and actually, one of the things that uh, uh, the Calvin Smith Library sponsors is a series of lectures called Scholarly Communications Lectures. Uh, and uh, Tanya McPherson, who's the, one of the people behind this, uh, came and spoke uh, very recently. Uh, at the university and actually one of the first projects that went in here uh, was called Virtual Vaudeville uh, which tried to recreate vaudeville theater um, in uh, the early uh, 19th century or early 1900s. Um, he also spoke here as well in one of these lecture series. When you come to Vectors they ask you to draw so you draw something here uh, and then you can enter into the site itself and uh, this is a journal that uh, the contents of which cannot be represented entirely in text. Um, it, it just cannot happen. The, uh, the multimedia, the visual element, the data elements are so important that it has to be displayed uh, through the use of a computer. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of projects. Uh, you can actually go to an archive to see all of the issues. And the very first issue, uh, David Saltz is actually the person who came to speak here on Virtual Vaudeville. That's a very nice uh, piece if you get a chance to take a look at it. Uh, but the one I wanted to show you was the unmaking of markets. 
So what was done here is um, the researcher, so Rebecca, um, went, uh, was interested in how and market development in Tuscany. So she looked at what she was finding when she was doing her research was that um, there was no evidence that was specific to an individual or to a family. So what she did was create a call, what's called a composite. So what she found was a lot of evidence for people throughout a time period. And she took all of that evidence and kind of amalgamated it. It's kind of like evidence-based medicine or randomized controlled trials where you put them all together to get a, a broader a meta-analysis. So she did kind of the same thing um, with some historical documents um, from Tuscany. And she looked at two regions, one in the south and one in the north. Uh, the one in the north was influenced by Florence. And uh, Florentine merchants were coming in and they were buying up land. And they were buying up so much of the land that they actually influenced the, the way markets worked in uh, Tuscany in rural areas. In the southern region, um, in these markets, what happened in the rural areas was land would consistently move through families. So if I had a family that was large, I would farm more land to grow more crops. As my family grew smaller, I would sell off land and then uh, other people would buy it. So there was a constant cycling of ownership of land. Whereas in the north, with the Florentines moving in, they started consuming land and they didn't resell it back. So they would only sell it in large masses. Well, to make this more visually understandable, um, she used, uh, again, simulations or multimedia. So in this case, she has a grid which simulates land holding patterns and this would be Florentine. The Florentine landowners are in red, and the rural uh, owners are in the yellow or gold. And this was the uh, south, the small holdings. And what you can see is uh, patterns of how the land holdings moved. So it runs a simulation. This is on land markets. Um, you can speed it up. You can slow it down. Um, and you can see, and there are, there's a key so you can see what these various um, icons mean as they are uh, flashing up on the screen. This simulates the labor markets, so how people sold their labor. So you can run simulations, um, you can reset them, you can see how things uh, according to her uh, model, would work. Another thing that I found uh, rather interesting about this was that she used actual scans from documents, from art at the time in the creation of this site. So this just gives a, a, a visual landscape of what Tuscany would look like, and then there are characters that you see moving around in the plots of land. And if you mouse over them, uh, you will actually see the documents uh, from which they were taken and then placed into this. Um, I think that was the same one. And she also included original photographs from her visits to the region. Uh, so again, and you know, this is done with flash. Um, there are ways in Flash that you can actually go directly to the you know, pop-ups for your citations um, and so forth. But I thought that's another good example of uh, the use of multimedia in research. Another really quickly, I don't want to consume all of the time here, is from... This is called Public Secrets, and it's about uh, three prisons in a 30-mile radius in, in Central California, and it specifically focuses on women in prisons. And it uses um, kind of ethnographic and recorded interviews to provide uh, more intimate access to their stories. And so again, this is just another example of you know, you might be doing research and, or you might be doing a, your dissertation and it might include ethnographic interviews or it might record, uh, you might have recorded interviews. Well, how else can you use them other than just citing them in the text? 
or providing transcriptions? Are there ways that you can include those to make it more um, accessible to those coming um, to experience uh, what you've done? Its site is an agribusiness desert between Los Banos and Chowchilla, where there are three prisons within 30 square miles. Past the metal detector, through two electronic gates, under the gaze of the gun towers, there is an uncannily suburban, perfectly manicured lawn. Between the fence and the visiting room, I follow a rose-lined path surrounded by razor wire glinting in the relentless heat. This space is a counter site intended to re-inscribe the symbolic order of the space of the prison as safe, calm, domesticated. Okay. The prison I'm going to cut the sequence there to not dwell on it too long. Um, but you can actually come into the site and listen to the interviews that were done with uh, various women. What are they accomplishing? What are they accomplishing? This is not a correctional facility. It's a penal colony. It, is not, it has nothing to do with corrections. The teachers don't teach. They don't. You, they occupy time. They get paid by the head. They don't care what they teach or if they teach or if you draw or if you, some of them say, well, you can lay down and sleep just until the principal gets you. So again, um, a, a transcription might uh, be valuable, included in the text of uh, a dissertation or a research project, but it's more, how much more powerful is it, I guess I would ask, to hear the actual woman who's in prison talking about it. Um, so including multimedia assets um, can enhance um, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, finally, I just wanted to, uh, Kathy, uh, pointed out um, that the um, Network Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertations gives out an award, uh, or eight awards, eight awards uh, for uh, dissertations that use multimedia in um, innovative ways. Um, and I thought I would just show you uh, an example of one of those. Um, so, uh, Heather Forrest was curious about um, actually studying the creative process as it was happening. So she went through a process of creating a story um, and paid very close attention to how her ideas evolved, how she got them, when they came to her, um, and just went through the whole progression of the process of creating the story from the start to the finish. And she documented it, um, and throughout she recorded um, songs, pieces of the story, uh, folk tales. Uh, so all these uh, accompanying files have been included along with the dissertation itself. And this would work more like um, what I saw today in terms of a Word document dissertation that's been converted to a PDF that's been uploaded, and then you would uh, you know, allow or attach these accompanying uh, uh, digital assets, these MP3 files, with the dissertation. They actually don't do anything in the dissertation itself. Um, the dissertation points to them, uh, so they are just literally accompanying files or supplementary files. But this would be an example of um, using audio files to accompany your dissertation, so working with it that way. Um, now, the Friedman Center, um, at the Friedman Center, we can help you do this. Now, we don't do anything for you. Uh, we are an end user, end service uh, facility. So I, I just wanted to kind of get that clear so you don't come in expecting uh, us to be able to, to do all of this for you. Uh, but we will consult with you and we will work with you and we will actively help and support you. Uh, so if you have an idea, uh, about, you know, say you wanted to do some kind of an ethnographic interview and you wanted to record people 
through your interviews and you wanted to include those assets and you had questions about what kind of equipment should I use, uh, what file format should I use, if I, you know, if I capture them as waves, how do I convert them to MP3s, um, what's the bit rate that I should be using, I mean, all these kinds of questions. Uh, if you come to the Freedman Center, we can work with you. We can provide you with some equipment. I actually have a PowerPoint presentation that shows all the equipment, but I thought, uh, so I can see some of you are dozing off. Uh, I thought that would do a better job of putting you to sleep than, uh, than just my standing up here. Um, but uh, come into the Freedman Center, by all means, look at our equipment. We have you know, digital video cameras, digital voice recorders, a whole slew of types, uh, digital cameras, uh, laptops, um, flip video, uh, we have a host of software on our computers, uh, the entire Creative Suite 4 for Adobe, as well as many, many other things. Um, and we will be, we'll be glad to work with you. Uh, we have a program called Case Learns. I don't know if any of you saw the Case Learns document uh, of classes out there on the stand uh, out front, but this is the catalog of uh, Case Learns classes. And one of them specifically, there's a section called Friedman Center Multimedia Tools. So um, Jared Bendis is the creative director of new media in the Friedman Center. He's actually our multimedia expert. So in many of these projects, he would probably be the one that you would work with. Uh, but he teaches many of these courses as well. So digital imaging, digital video, audio, things like that. Uh, I'm more of a web, web person myself. Um, yeah, and again, we can work with you so we can do consulting, and um, it's open to faculty, students, staff, and alumni, and we have plenty of space and resources for you to use. Um, so that's all I've got. I wanted to leave time for Debbie to come up, because I know many of you, in terms of formatting your dissertations, will probably come to her uh, for help with the Microsoft Word, uh, and she will consult with you in the Friedman Center. Um, on the formatting. Well, thanks everyone. I'm Debbie Crody. Um, I am an instructor for Case Learns, and as Tom just mentioned, hopefully you grabbed a catalog. Our class will start up here soon, probably in the next few weeks. Um, there is one class that might be of special interest to you. It's on uh, Friday, February 5th in the afternoon from 1 to 5, and it's specifically using Microsoft Word 2007. Uh, to help you with um, formatting your thesis or dissertation. And you know, the types of things we're going to go over are, are useful things that people are like, oh, Word's easy, you just type. Well, there's a lot you can do in Word. You can um, use things like section breaks when you have a change in format, like maybe you went from portrait view to landscape view. You need a section break to do something like that. Or uh, say you need different page numbering, like maybe you're going to use Roman numerals, like those little eyes on your uh, table of contents pages, but then start with one in your document. You need a section break for stuff like that. So the types of things I'm going to go over in that class are using Word to format the document, uh, things like headers, footers, page numbering. And a great feature Word has that people often um, overlook are styles. How many people have ever created or used styles in Word? If, if you're going to be doing a long document, styles are going to save you so much time. Um, a style is a format that can be saved with a name, and there are built-in styles that Word has, like Heading 1, Heading 2, Heading 3, but you can create your own custom styles, and it allows you then, like say you have a chapter heading and then a subheading or whatever, subtopic, you can quickly format that text with the styles, but the best thing that you can do is you can generate your table of contents, which is a requirement of your thesis, automatically from your styles. and. Um, Last spring, I was when we first started these um, appointments that I'm going to mention in a moment, some people came to me when they were pretty much done. My document's done. How do I convert it to a PDF? And they manually created their table of contents. And if, you're, if you have a 200-page document, you've got to go up and down through the document. This topic's on this page. What if your pagination changes? You have to go back and edit it. Within minutes, you can generate your table of contents based on using your styles. If your pagination changes, you can update the TOC and it, it will save you so much time. So those are some of the things we're going to uh, try to cover in that class. Also, I imagine a lot of you will have um, figures and tables throughout your document. You can um, use captions. Um, if you insert them the correct way, then you can also generate like a table of figures and a table of, uh, of, table of tables, I guess, is what you would call it. So I'm just going to try to show you how to use Word properly uh, to help you with creating your document. 
Um, there's also going to be available, as Tom was mentioning, one-on-one -on -one appointments um, in the Friedman Center. So there was like a one-page flyer, hopefully you grabbed that, where basically you can, uh, you and I could sit together, bring your document electronically, we can open it up, and if you have questions, you know, how do I do this, how do I fix that, I'll try to help you with that, how do I convert it to a PDF, those are the types of things I'm, I'm here to help you with, so, okay, all right. Any questions? Yeah, oh yeah. So at what stage in the paper progression ideally would you like us to come to the Freedom Center? Because I mean to wait to after the defense or to do it you know what, um, I, I actually had somebody last year who hadn't really even started typing up their document who sat with me just to get some ideas of things they can do in their document. I had people came, you know, come when it was pretty much final and they just needed to convert it. So it's really uh, your call, but um, it's really your call. I've, I've helped people at the start and at the end and, and, and anywhere in between. But there's, there's no a lot reason. of things you could do to save time, as I was mentioning. There's no reason you can't do it more than once. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. And, and these are one-on-one -on -one appointments, so you can block off like a, a half an hour, or an hour. Um, and some of you might be starting now, but maybe you're not going to finish up till to the fall. They'll, I'm assuming we'll, they'll be offered again, you know, next semester as well. So, okay. yeah. do you have any templates for uh, Word or for like LaTeX, for example, for dissertation? You know what? Other than like, I, I personally don't have any Word templates. Certainly, you can. Um, when you're using Microsoft Word, if, if you go to uh, create a new document where you can pick a template, you could just search for thesis templates and see what's available from Office Online and possibly look at those as an example. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, I wanted to say a couple things. One of the reasons we started these classes with Debbie, the classes and the one-on-one, -on -one, is because there was such a tremendous demand. We found students coming in, I'm lost, I'm spending so much time, I don't know how to do this, somebody needs to help me. So we created these classes and these one-on-ones to satisfy that need. So we hope that you take advantage of them. Um, back to what Tom was saying a little bit, um, we have a chicken and an egg thing here. We want students to use multimedia to enhance the presentation of their, their um, dissertation research. They don't know what they can do, so they don't do it. So they don't do it, so they don't know what they can do. Um, so I urge you to look through the ETD for dissertations that have used this. Um, I will send Denise, who can then forward it out to you, the center that makes these awards. And there's, there, you can look at these dissertations that have won awards for using multimedia, and there's a lot of science ones in there too. Um, look at them for the last few years, see what people are doing. So as you start thinking about this process of presenting and doing and presenting your research, you start thinking, well, what, you know, maybe I could use this, maybe I could do this. If you can think it, come in and talk about it. Maybe we can work out some way to do this, or at least start steering you in the right direction. Um, and we do hope within the next year to have some kind of grant um, program in place to encourage this um, among the graduate students. Some kind of monetary um, grant to uh, encourage the use of uh, innovative use of multimedia in your dissertation. So I just wanted to get another two cents in there. <laughs> <laughs>